So today is really, you know, our intro to set theory. Um, we're, we're not going to go super deep into set theory. We're going to give it a, a, a bit of a superficial view. Um, and we're going to give it, uh, like we've been doing with other concepts that we've been encountering, we're going to give it a bit of an algorithmic view as well. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to, uh, we're going to build procedures using Python as we've been doing. And, you know, what we're going to cover conceptually, random experiment, sample space, events, you know, just definitions of those. Um, and then we're going to consider some of the simple set operations. And then in the next lecture, we, which we might actually get uh, partway into today, hopefully we get into it today, um, the next lecture we'll touch on more uh, axioms of, of probability. And those we will also consider in a somewhat procedural way, although we'll use the actual set data type in Python to perform various operations. So, um, you know, we'll just give some basis for what a union, an intersection, a complement is when we get to those. And we're going to do something that may seem a little bit strange, um, you know, considering that we're talking about sets. We're going to approach sets initially through lists. And uh, we're going to do that for um, kind of algorithmic reasons. You know, we're going to look at, well, how do you perform a union between two lists? But we're going to think about the list as being a set. Okay. So um, I'm going to be using sets and, you know, these definitions of sets and lists in two different ways. And kind of what I mean by that is, well, we're going to, you know, give a, a mathematical, right, a math a math definition for a set. And then we're going to talk about a Python definition for the set data type. And what you'll see is that these two things are very similar, actually. And, um, and that's great. That's great. It's very useful to have sets in Python act like mathematical sets. But the way that we're going to uh, approach mathematical sets today is not through sets, but actually through lists. Okay. Um, there's some reasoning behind that. I'll probably, you know, uh, talk about that a little bit as we go through it. So I'm going to go ahead and open up. Um, oops, that is not the right directory. There we go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up our code for today, which is going to be in this uh, 02 sets directory. It's called sets.py, and I'm just opening it like this. And it's going to open up a bunch of stuff, I guess, but this is the file we'll, we'll be working in, just this uh, sets.py. I'll close everything else out. All right. Uh, so, you know, just really quickly, uh, sets are pretty simple to understand. And um, I think we, we, intuit we intuitively use uh, aspects of set theory quite often um, in our everyday language. We use, um, you know, concepts related to this when we organize and uh, just in basic logic, you know. And so when we're talking set theory, we don't really want to distinguish it from logic. And I'm going to do my best over the next two lectures or the next two sets of slides to, to illustrate that. Um, we're going to think of logical operations and set operations as being very, very, very similar. Uh, but before we get to that, let's think about the idea of a random experiment. So we have this concept in set theory um, experiment. Uh, in set theory, in logic, in a number of other places in probability where we have a random experiment. And what do we mean by that? Well, uh, the way I like to think about it is that there is some phenomenon, right? There's some phenomenon where we don't know the outcome. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. And, you know, so with an unknown outcome. Uh, and what I mean by that is an unknown specific outcome. Now, we might have a number of possible outcomes, like let's consider a coin flip 
as a phenomenon, right? So we've got a coin flip. Well, we, we know that there are two possible outcomes, but we don't know what the specific outcome is until we perform the experiment, right? So we could have either heads or a tails as a result of, of a coin flip. So here's our phenomenon, flipping a coin. Our experiment is, well, the out, it considers the outcome uh, of a single coin flip. And so, you know, if it's a equally weighted coin, if it's a fair coin, we all, always call this a fair coin, um, then there's a 50-50 chance that we're gonna get heads or tails, right? Uh, pretty straightforward. We can think about this in terms of other things, right? Like uh, rolling a die. So we've got a die roll and we've got a set of potential outcomes in a die roll, uh, a six-sided die roll, let's say, two, three, four, five, and six. Any one of these outcomes could occur and they would occur with equal probability. Now, there, there are other things that uh, definitely qualify as random experiments and maybe I'll make that a little bit Oh, okay. I'll just use. So there are other things that definitely qualify as random experiments that don't look like coin flips or rolls of a die or something like that. Um, what if we are inspecting hardware and there is a part that um, has, you know, three states uh, that it can be in? So, um, so let's call this part inspection or something like that as a phenomenon and when we inspect a part there are three possible states um you know let's say good um failed or uh you know malfunctioning and we have some means of quantifying the probability of any one of these things good failing or malfunctioning and how do, how did we build those probabilities well We've been doing this for a long time and we've been looking at a lot of parts and we've been recording these results over a long period of time. And through that sampling process, we've built some uh, set of possible states, good, failing or malfunctioning. And, uh, you know, there is some slight difference between failing and malfunctioning. Maybe malfunctioning is somewhat intermittent, uh, but we draw a hard line between failing and malfunctioning. Let's say that we do. And when we're thinking about this, uh, we've built this data set and maybe, you know, the part is good 95% of the time and is failing, uh, you know, let's say 4% uh, of the time and is malfunctioning, you know, 1% uh, of the time. And, you know, we can understand the phenomenon through these two lenses. What are the potential outcomes? What are the probabilities of each outcome? Now, uh, we're going to build probability off of set theory initially. And then, and we're going to build it also um, kind of independently somewhat off of counting. And, you know, we'll get into counting and we'll, we'll really think about uh, what counting means. Uh, but, you know, until we get there, um, the basis for how we consider probability will be through the idea of, of sets. And I'm going to draw this a number of times um, so the probability of something happening, and let's call that, uh, let's call that an event. The probability of an event A happening is going to be uh, kind of the uh, what we're going to call the cardinality of, event, of the event. You know, like the um, number of times that event occur, occurs or potentially occurs um, out of the number of potential events, which we're going to call. S. We're going to call that the kind of superset of events or the containing set of the uh, event A. Now, that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. I just want to seed this idea so that, you know, we're going to see this over and over again. Um, when we see this over and over again, we'll tie it back to set theory. So I'm just throwing that out there. Don't worry about remembering that right now. I'm going to say it a number of times. Um, so let's say you have a two-headed coin, okay? Um, you have a two-headed coin, and, uh, well, what are the potential outcomes? The potential outcomes are heads or heads. Um, you can only get a head, you get, get a heads out of a two-headed coin. And so if the question is, what is the probability of getting, you know, flipping this coin and getting a heads? Well, that's 
it's a certainty, right? It's certain. So heads is certain here. If, it, if you have a certain outcome, then you might, well, let's not say might, then you don't really have a random experiment. So it doesn't matter how many times you flip this coin, you're going to get heads every time. You know, we're not really experimenting here. We're, we're just sort of uh, flipping a coin for fun. Um, unless there's some other, you know, some other phenomenon we're trying to observe there, like how many flips uh, the coin will make when you flip it or something like that. We can analyze a different phenomenon related to this coin, but we can't really analyze, uh, you know, the, uh, we can't effectively analyze heads versus something else because there's nothing else. It's, it's just heads. Um, now, with this two-headed coin, uh, we might ask the question, well, what is the probability of getting tails? Well, zero. Um, and so the probability of getting ta tails from a two-headed coin is impossible. That outcome is impossible. And that's the word that we would use, right? Pretty intuitive. Um, if, if you are considering an impossible outcome, you might, be, you might not be dealing with a random experiment, okay? If you're dealing with either a certain outcome or an impossible outcome, you might not be dealing with a random experiment. Okay, so uh, I've been talking about, I've been mentioning this word set, and let's, let's define this. Okay, so the definition of a set, um, for, our, for our purposes here, we're going to take a very simple definition, and we're going to call this a well-defined collection of, uh, we can call these objects or events or outcomes. And uh, keep in mind that the, the, this well-defined part, right? If we're talking about flipping a coin and we're talking about outcomes, well, we have to define what the outcome is, uh, what the outcomes are, right? Um, if we're flipping a coin and we're considering heads versus tails, well, then your outcomes are heads or tails, right? That's, that makes sense. Uh, if we're flipping a coin and we're trying to talk about how many actual flips it makes, right? If, if that's what our random experiment is, the count of the flips, well, then, you know, maybe in that case, we would have, uh, you know, one flip, two flips, three flips, all the way up to, I don't know, however, however many potential flips we can make or that we've recorded, which maybe would be around 70. That's a very different thing that we're considering as opposed to heads versus tails, right? So we need to define this well. Um, so one very important aspect of a set, uh, very, very important and um, actually very helpful too uh, within Python is that there are no duplicates in a set. Okay. So if you're recording the outcomes of an experiment, like, uh, like flipping a coin, well, if you flip a coin the first time you get heads and maybe the second time you get heads and then you get tails and you get heads again and then you get tails and tails and then tails and you get tails again and then heads and then tails. Uh, this list is not a set of outcomes, okay? That's not a set of outcomes. This, if we consider each of these moments to be an experiment and heads and tails to be the specific outcomes of that experiment, then this is actually a series of outcomes. It is not a set. The set of this would just be heads and tails, okay? So uh, don't, make, don't get confused about that. Um, there are going to be situations where we define a phenomenon and we have some uh, type of event, some kind of underlying aspect of the phenomenon that, uh, let's say, uh, let's say we're counting the number of uh, heads that it might occur in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, in ten coin flips, right? Maybe that's the outcome that we're defining in our set. And if we've got ten coin flips and we're thinking about this in terms of all the potential outcomes, well, you're going to have zero heads, one heads, two heads all the way up until 10 heads. And in that case, uh, this, like heads is not the outcome and tails is not the outcome. The count of heads would be the outcome, right? And so there are a number of different ways that we can achieve one, two, three, four heads in 10 coin flips. There's a number of different ways we can do that. This is not the only way, um, but at the end of the day, the set that we would be considering 
would actually be, uh, you know, the range of numbers between uh, between zero and ten, right? That would be our set if we're considering count of heads within ten coin flips. So, uh, well defined in this case, not only defines the outcomes, it defines the uh, the thing we're interested in in the phenomenon itself. Uh, so that that's pretty important. Now, what do we use to represent a set? Uh, often we'll use if we're talking about the set of all outcomes. We'll often call this capital S, and that's where that S came in be from before. Okay, um, so S for our purposes here, uh, and as we go forward, is going to be the containing set, the universal set, or the sample space. Okay, and that that's an important word to consider. The sample space is going to be uh, essentially uh, the set of all potential outcomes. So um, if we're you know in this case if we're counting the number of heads in ten coin flips, well that's going to be this range of numbers, the set 0, 1, 2, 3, up, up until 10. So we could possibly get 10 heads. Uh, there are times where we'll, we'll use different notation. Um, we won't do this, but you'll see this. Uh, S is pretty common for the sample space. You, you might also see a capital U. Uh, you might also see an, a capital omega. Um, these mean uh, essentially universal set. Um, you know, they might mean a uh, superset or sample space, depending on um, the semantics being used in what you're looking at. We'll stick with S, though, for the most part. Um, I might use U here and there, but um, we'll probably stick with S. Okay, so um, I mentioned Python has sets, math has sets, and those two things are very similar. Um, I want to show you a trick that will come back around over and over again. It's one of those uh, really um, important tricks to know. Uh, and, and the reason I say trick is that it, it's a way to use a set in Python or really any language that has a set data type. It's a way to use a set to do something you wouldn't expect it to do. Uh, you know, it, it solves a simple problem is, is kind of what I'm getting at. This is called the list set trick. And I'm going to say the list set trick for uh, deduping. Now, what do I mean by deduping? Um, well, let's just let's just demonstrate this. So let's say we have some list, and this is going to be a list of sports. How about kayaking and tennis and uh, Rolf ball, which is a game nobody knows about that some of my friends play. And uh, how about swimming and maybe uh, tennis again and maybe um, kayaking one more time. So the list set trick, what this is what this is really about is removing duplicates and it's it's really uh, it's really kind of um, kind of boneheaded, kind of easy. If we take this list and we cast it to a set, a set cannot have duplicate objects, okay? Can't have duplicate objects. And so if we cast a list to a set, then we remove duplicates, right? If we do that, we can cast it back to a list and we have removed duplicates from a list, okay? Um, so if I do this uh, and then I'll just print the list, we can see, uh, we'll be able to see that the duplicates are removed. So uh, Python sets.py, swimming, tennis, kayaking, Rolf ball. Now, I want you to notice this, though. The order has not been preserved here, OK? So notice, um, in this case, I have not preserved order. Kayaking is now the third object. Uh, tennis is the second object. Rolf ball is the last object. And swimming is the first object. Why is that? Um, well, in this operation, we do not guarantee the order of the list. Okay. Now, there are times where you will want to maintain the order of a list in a deduplication process. And so um, I'm going to just demonstrate how you would do that. If you need to maintain order, 
uh, let's say in, in this case, if we're deduping list, uh, if we need to have it say kayaking, tennis, rolf ball, swimming, and then just drop these last two, we're gonna have to do this a little bit differently, okay? Um, and uh, the list set trick wouldn't really work. So I'm gonna write a function called, make this a little bit bigger. Uh, I'm gonna write a function called dedupe in order to show how you might do this. So we're gonna uh, make, we're gonna pass in a list and uh, I'm gonna do this in a very simple way, all right? Um, it's just gonna be a very simple collector pattern. Uh, collectors, it's an accumulator that uses a collection uh, like a list. I'm gonna say, well, deduped, the thing I'm gonna return, I'll call that deduped. And I'm gonna say for each element in this list, if the element is not already in deduped, then we can append it, the deduped.append the element, okay? We can return, we can return deduped. And uh, in this case, we'll see that we maintain order. So uh, I'll call this, I'll make this a little smaller so you can see it all in one place. And I'll call this function on the list and print it. And what we'll see here is uh, now we've maintained order. Tennis, kayaking, rolf ball, swim, wait a minute. Did we not maintain order? Hmm. What is going on there? Let's try that again. There we go. Okay. So now um, kayaking, which is the first thing. Uh, oh my gosh. What is happening? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I left this thing. Uh, I left this call on line five where I performed the list set trick and then I ran dedupe on that list. So um, why don't I do this instead? Why don't I just uh, modify this? So we're printing the uh, list set trick instead of uh, reassigning list. So now this should work. Okay. Kayaking, tennis, rolf ball, swimming. So that, uh, if we're thinking about uh, just a, an immediately pragmatic use of, of the set. We can think about the list set trick, but notice that you lose order of your original list when you do that. So if you want to maintain order, you can use a very simple accumulator pattern like, like we did here, okay? So that's, uh, that may seem like a brief aside, but um, often we, we very often we'll use uh, the list set trick in order to solve various problems. Okay, so um, just as a reminder, uh, you know, I already used this word one, this term once, sample space. If we're considering a six-sided die, then our sample space is going to be one, two, three, four, five, and six, okay? That's uh, every possible outcome for the uh, role of a six-sided die, if we're if what we're considering is the count of, this is a word I'm going to use more than once, the count of the pips. Pips are just dots on a die. Um, it's just a different word, right? Dots is what that means. Um, and uh, you know, when we're talking about when we're talking uh, probability, we talk a lot about dice and we call those things pips. Okay, so um, so let's think about some other things in terms of uh, the sample space. We can consider uh, events in S, okay? We can consider events in regards to this sample space and we, and we can define them strictly. So um, uh, let's say we have an event A, okay? And A is going to be all of the um, all of the dice rolls that have a count of pips greater than three. Okay, so A would be four, five, and six. Right, those are all get greater than three. We can see that A is a subset of S. Right, it is a subset of S. And uh, 
some people will call S a superset of A. Um, you know, I might use that terminolo terminology sometimes. Don't be surprised about that. I'll try to avoid it. I'll probably just try to say A is a subset of S, that kind of thing. Um, we can define a different kind of event. We can define the event B is all the odd counts of pips, right? So this would be one, three, and five. B is also a subset of S, okay? B is a sort of strict subset of S. Now, uh, we can define a whole bunch of other versions of this. We could define uh, C being the evens, right? This would be two, four, and six. Uh, we can define another set D, another subset D, that is um, the numbers that are divisible into other numbers in the set, okay? So uh, one is divisible into everything, two is divisible into four, and three is divisible into six. Um, yeah, I guess we just leave it at that, uh, unless we want to include the number that it's divisible into, you know, maybe, maybe we do. Maybe that's a rule we define. Notice we are defining these rules, okay? We're defining what this subset means, what that event means, what that outcome is. Um, and so when we do this, we can ask other questions. And this brings us back to this, what is the probability of A? Well, the probability of A in this case is going to be uh, the size of A, how many items are in A, which is three, so kind of the magnitude or cardinality is what we call that of A, which is three, over the magnitude or cardinality of S, which is six. So the probability of the outcome A would just be 0.5 or one half, right? Okay. So um, I think that gets us uh, through most of the definitions here. Um, oh, let me answer this question really quick. Uh, when you run the code in REPL, it removes all duplicates, only returning the elements that are in the list once. Huh. I wonder what's going on there. Uh, if the element is not in deduped, dedupe.append element, return deduped. Dedupe in order, list two. I am I am not sure what's happening there. Let me let me copy that over and run it really fast. Let me see if there's something. Um, something I'm missing in here. Okay, so this is what I'm seeing. Kayaking, tennis, swimming, swimming, tennis. Uh, deduped in order, uh, deduped in order, deduped, uh, deduped in order, list two, and you're seeing kayaking as the result. Um, okay. Ah, I see what the issue, okay, look. Your return is tabbed in. So this is actually only adding the first element from list two. If we back this return off, then uh, then it won't be in the for loop. That's what's going on there. Um, that's one of those uh, sometimes harder to see uh, errors. Notice now um, it's working correctly. Cool. All right. So a um, little bit more abstraction theory, however we want to think about that. Um, let's think about this in the uh, classical kind of graphical view, okay? So this is where we might start thinking about Venn diagrams. And um, so we have this sample space S, and let's say we have a couple events. We have uh, event A, and we have event B. And notice in this, in this, uh, in this view, We've got um, a lot of different areas that we might consider, okay? We've got uh, the stuff that, uh, we've got all of A and B, right? Like if we think about all of A and B, we've got that whole area. Oh. We've got the, the area that A and B shares. We've got the stuff that's in A that's not in B. We've got the stuff that's in B that's not in A. We've got, um, we've actually got A, uh, the stuff that's in A and the stuff that's in B, but not what they share, right? So um, we have something like that. Uh, we've got, you know, everything that is not in A or B, right? We've got all that. 
So there, there are a lot of different uh, visual ways we can think about set operations. And um, we're, you know, everything that I just did, we can, uh, we can approach uh, in code in, in one way or another, okay? Um, and we're, we can do that with a few very simple operations, um, namely, uh, namely union. Oops. Just write these down really fast. Uh, namely union, intersection, and complement. Now, uh, the way that I'm going to uh, annotate these, if, if we have A, A union B is going to look like that. A, the sort of capital U, B. Um, that's just a symbol for union. The intersection we're going to do like this, and uh, complement. Um, what I'm likely going to do is uh, I'm just going to say not a for the complement. Okay, um, I think that's nice because it looks like what we do in Python. Uh, there are a lot of different ways we can do that, and we'll revisit that in a second as we define these. So we'll start off with. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one other one. Uh, set difference that um, we can actually accomplish that difference with other set operations. So I, I always forget about that one. But um, this is the stuff that's in A that's not in B. So we actually just use a minus sign in that case. OK, so let's start off with the simplest one, and uh, or maybe the simplest one to think about. And that is uh, set union. So this will be the union. We've got uh, A and B. So here's B. Here's A. Oh, let me make that actually a different color. And the union of these is going to be everything that is in A, everything that's in B, and of course, what they share. So uh, notice there might be a little bit of a dilemma here in terms of what they share because. Uh, you know, if you take everything in A and everything in B, you're going to have some uh, duplicates, essentially, depending on how you construct this. Um, but notice that, you know, remember that sets can't have duplicates. That, that's just not an option. So um, we regard this as A, this sort of U-shape B, A union B. So um, we, can, uh, we can think of union very much like the logical operation in Python, or. Uh, effectively, it's going to be the same thing from our perspectives, right? Where, um, let's say you have uh, true or false. Well, the outcome of that is going to be true, right? If, if it's false or true, the outcome still is true. Uh, we're going to make a strong connection between, between the set operation union and the logical operation or. Um, something that something else here that you might want to consider is that we could have a third event here called C. And C is going to be included in that. But notice when I included C, um, I only had to fill in this because all of the stuff that was in uh, this region, or let me be clear about that, this region this region and this region, those were already in the union of A with B. And so, uh, you know, notice we can say A union B union C. And uh, that describes what we're seeing in this Venn di diagram. Um, and I'll, I'll say this now, I'll probably say this again. Uh, A union B union C is the same as B union A union C is the same. Oops. Union A union C, which is the same as C union B union A, and so on. Every, every possible way of arranging that uh, means the same thing. So uh, in some sense, this is just an instant operation. OK, so I'm going to have you code a union function. All right? Um, and we can say, I'll, I'll give this some starter, def union. And uh, this is going to be the union for two lists. So I'll give you 
I'll, I'll give you some values for these lists. We'll have list one and list two. And let's think about, um, well, I don't know. Let's think about, uh, let's think about some animals. How about that? I think that's, um, let's call this anim one and anim two. And uh, I'll make an anim three while we're at it. Uh, since we want to be able to, we, we're going to eventually do this for multiple lists. Um, but uh, I'll have you try to code union of two lists first. So uh, let me just finish off this stub. And let's put some animals in here. So let's say there's a jellyfish, a lion, a tiger, cricket. Squid, a cat, and then in this next one, we're gonna have um, how about a tiger, a cat, an eagle, a shark, um, uh, I don't know, a manta ray, and in this last one, let's have a lion, a um, meerkat, a dog, a shark, an eagle, and how about a prairie dog? Okay. So uh, when you call this, um, we can go ahead and think about what you should get if you call union on anim1 uh, union to anim2, right? And uh, we should be able to just see this. We've got tiger shared between anim1 and 2. And we've got anything else? Oh, did I just do one thing? Cat, eagle, shark, manta ray. Yeah, the, oh, cat. I'm sorry. Tiger and cat are shared between anim1 and anim2. So that's what we should expect. Um, we should expect to return a list that contains tiger and cat. Okay. So I'll throw all of this in the Slack, and you've got uh, four minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll do four minutes to code this, and then we'll work through a solution, and then I'll walk us through coding this for um, uh, in a for multiple lists. So I'll set a timer, and uh, yeah, go for it. Oh my gosh, I gave you the total wrong outcome. I gave you the outcome for the intersection. Thank you. <laughs> my bad, here. Let me give you the actual outcome you would expect. 
which is going to be uh, jellyfish, lion, tiger, cricket, squid, cat. And then uh, we already have tiger, so you are not gonna have that. We already have eagle, so we're not gonna have that. Uh, sorry, uh, already have tiger and cat. Okay, so sorry, that should be the expected outcome. I'll correct that in the Slack as well. Apologies for that. Thanks for thanks for catching that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start coding this. Um, if you feel like you're close, uh, definitely keep going. And uh, I'll, I'll put the uh, solution and everything prior as well into the Slack in just a moment. Okay, so uh, we've got this union of set one and set, or list one and list two, right? Because these are lists. So I'm gonna create the set union, set one uh, dot copy. And uh, I'm doing that because, well, sorry, this should be list one. Um, I'm doing that because I'm going to take everything that's in list one, and I'm just gonna take anything that's in list two that's not in list one and put it in there, uh, which is pretty straightforward. I can say for each item in list two, uh, if that item is not in our set union, then uh, I'm gonna say set union dot append, I'll append the item, and uh, that should be good. So I can return the set union at that point, and uh, we should have a working solution. So let me see if that works. Um, what we expected was jellyfish, lion, tiger, cricket, squid, cat, eagle, shark, manta ray, and that worked. Cool. So uh, when, we, when we consider uh, when we consider union, we can also consider uh, the union of multiple sets, right? Uh, so let me show you something in Python that, that is likely new to you, um, but it's kind of, uh, how do I say this? It's one of those things that, that you will definitely use in the future, but you don't need to know much about it now, okay? So this is another, I, I think, this class, this lecture has a few asides, and this is one of those asides. Um, there's a concept called star args, okay? Um, which is kind of a weird name. Call it star args, right? Star args. And the reason we call it that is that uh, it's actually represented by this thing, this, you know, little asterisk args. Now, what star args do is they allow an arbitrary number of parameters to be passed in to a function, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, um, let's say we have some function and, uh, you know, we have argument one and then, you know, maybe we wanna put a whole bunch more arguments in there, right? Maybe we wanna do that. If we wanna do that, well, how, how many argument, arguments are we going to have? I don't know, maybe seven, maybe three. 
Well, if we don't know how many, then we might do this thing like star arcs, okay? And then um, I can, what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna print the type of, uh, well, I'm gonna print the type, type of arcs first. Um, so I'm gonna print the type of this thing that we're seeing here, this star arcs. And we'll just see what that is really quick. And then I'm gonna say for each item in args, let's print each item. And then we, let's not return anything. Um, I'm explicitly gonna state return none um, just for the purposes here. So uh, if we've got arg1, let's say arg1 is, you know, cat, I don't know. And then these args are like tree, um, let's do tree, forest, um, epsilon, I don't know, something like that. And let's see if that works. And notice uh, args itself is a tuple. So what's happening here is uh, notice that uh, cat didn't print out, right? Cat went into this arg1 and everything else went into args. And it went into args like uh, as if it was a tuple already defined like that. Um, so that's a convenience. It's a convenience for us to use this. Now, uh, let me make this maybe a, a bit more, uh, a bit more meaningful with an actual problem. So, like, uh, add. Let's call this add nums, and let's do star nums. Doesn't have to be called args. It's just a convention. We call it star args, um, and. What this is going to do is say for num in nums, well, let's add all those up. Let's say let's say uh, we've got some running sum started at zero, and for each num in nums, sum is going to get num added to it. Uh, why, don't, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this instead? Let's do product of nums since, you know, I think it's because why wouldn't we just use the sum function, right? Let's let's write something that's a little bit more uh, a little bit more meaningful so we have a uh, product product it gets multiplied by each number and then we return the product right so the product of uh let's print this product of nums for i don't know i'll just start mashing some numbers here we can do that and uh, let's do another one of these and in this case, we'll just do five, three, and five. So uh, let's see how that goes. Oh, we get zero because I started the product at zero. Let's try that again. Okay. So um, we can put in an arbitrary number of arguments. And you can see how that might be helpful depending on the problem we're trying to solve. Okay. So um, in this case, we're passing in an arbitrary number of uh, you know, numbers. And we can pass in however many that is, like 12 or something, and then three uh, different numbers. And that'll work in both cases. So we can use this idea uh, to write a union for multiple sets. And you know, if we look up here, we've got, um, well, where is it? Uh, we've got sets uh, one, two, and three, animal, animals one, two, and three. And maybe we want to do a union of all of these. So let, let's write, I'm going to just write something that will show a way that you can do that. Um, that's pretty straightforward um, using star arcs. So I'm going to call this, uh, I'll call this the union of multiple sets just to follow what's in the slides. And I'm going to do star multiple sets. So again, I don't need to name this args. I can name it uh, whatever I'm going to name it. Uh, in this case, I'm naming it multiple sets. So I'll do the set union, and I'll start. I'll start my set union off as just an empty list, and then I can say for each list, right? Because uh, what we're going to pass in is three different lists uh, according to what we have above. So for each list in uh, those multiple sets, that uh, tuple that's going to be populated by lists. For each list in multiple sets, uh, for each item in each list, if the item is not already in the union, then we can say set union dot append that item. 
and uh, we can just return the union at the end of all that. Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, let's try it out with uh, animals one, two, and three. So let's print union multiple sets for anim. What is it? Anim one, like that. Anim two and anim three. And this should be everything that is in these. And uh, notice the last values, prairie dog. I think that just gives us a good indication indicator that uh, this is working as we'd expect. Um, so let me start pasting some stuff in the Slack because um, if you didn't come to a solution for union, then um, it's probably probably going to be hard to come to a solution for intersection. And uh, I think union, you can use the union code to think about the intersection code. So I'm going to start pasting a couple of these in. I'll paste in the union of multiple sets as well. All right, so, so that's union. Let's uh, consider intersection next. All right, so uh, similar, we'll, we'll take a, you know, a visual look at this first. Uh, this is our containing set S, right, our sample space. Um, and then we've got B and we've got A and we've got the intersection that they share, right? So that, that makes sense. It's just, what do they share? And uh, we can think about this further with, um, you know, with C. And uh, if we do that, though, we have to eliminate what's right there. So um, it's only, if you notice, that kind of limits, limits the shared values. If we add another set to it, it has the potential to limit, it, limit that. Uh, how do we represent this? Well, this is just A intersect B intersect C. And again, we can write this in any order, right? We can write B intersect A intersect C or C intersect B intersect A. It, does, it doesn't matter, right? That However we write that is going to be fine. So um, let's, let's put, uh, I'll put some uh, code steps here. We're going to continue to use this anim one, two, and three. And I'm just going to copy it again so it's in view. And you're going to write a function called intersection. So def intersection, and we're going to take you know list one and list two, and you're going to return the intersection of those two. If you if you want to write an intersection for multiple sets. By all means, do that in, in the uh, breakout time. So let's put four minutes on for this as well. Timer four. And um, yeah, uh, code that intersection. Uh, oh, let me, let me give you also the expected results of anim1 and anim2. Anim1 anim2, and this will be the thing that I erroneously put last time. It'll just be a list that should say uh, tiger and cat, I believe. I don't think there's anything else shared there. No, okay. So uh, let me pass all of this in to the Slack. And I'll go ahead and start the timer. So. Four minutes, see, see where you get with that, and uh, then we'll go through a solution.
Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, let's do this. Um, so this is just, uh, this isn't so dissimilar from the prior function, although this time we don't want to make a copy of, uh, of list one. Um, instead, I'm just going to make an empty list. So I'll say set intersect, and I'm going to say, um, and just make that an empty list. And I'm going to collect into that anything that might make sense to collect. So for each item in set one, um, if that item is also in set two, um, we'll say set intersect dot append. Sorry, I keep calling these sets and I, I name them list. Um, item in list two. We'll say sit interse set intersect dot append the item. And uh, that's, that's it. Actually, uh, we can just return the set intersect at that point, and uh, that should work. Tiger and cat, that's indeed what we get. So um, as I did before, I'm going to just go ahead and code this for multiple sets. So um, this will be, just call this uh, def intersection intersection. Uh, multiple, and we'll, uh, what did I name that above? Um, oh, multiple sets, why don't we do that? Just copy this convention. Okay, uh, the intersection for multiple sets. Um, I'm, you know, this isn't so different from the prior one, uh, but I, I am going to um, maybe build in some safeguards here. So I'm gonna say set intersect, is going to be this empty list. And uh, here's the thing. If I want to make sure that I, I have, that I'm trying to intersect with more than one thing, okay? So if the length of, uh, of our multiple sets, right, that's our list of lists or our tuple of lists, we really need that to be greater than one. And we also need to make sure that the, um, you know, that nothing's empty in it. Uh, and, and this isn't going to, well, how about this? What would be a good way to do this? And um, the length of each list, I'm gonna do a little bit of magic here, uh, list for list in multiple sets. If uh, the length of list greater than zero for all of those. Um, and I'm going to use a keyword here called all. And what this logical operation is doing here is it's saying, well, let's make sure that every one of those is greater than zero in length. Because um, if any of those have zero length, then, well, we're gonna return an empty set, right? We're, it's just gonna be empty. So um, we, we need to make sure there's more than one and that all of them are greater than zero. So uh, that may be a little bit confusing. Um, that's something that I, I could break down at the end of class if, uh, but really maybe I'll just annotate this. I'll say, um, make sure we have more than one set and each set has um, more than zero elements. How about that? Okay. So uh, I'm, do, I'm going to check each item. So for each item in multiple sets, um, actually, let's start with the first set uh, that's in there, okay? And then we can ask, well, is, I'm gonna make a flag here called is member. And by default, we're gonna assume each item is a member of all the sets until we find out otherwise. So I'm gonna say for um, uh, set in uh, multiple sets and we'll look at all the rest of them from one on, right? Does that make sense? Uh, so for all the rest of them, aside from this first one that we're looking at here on line 89, um, I'm going to say if the item is not in, if that item that we're considering up here if that item is not in every one of those other sets, then um, 
then we want to decide that it's not a member of the resulting intersection, okay? And if it's not a member, we don't need to check anything else. We can just break. And uh, after, after those for loops complete, we can say is member, um, if, if it is a member, if that stayed true, then we can append to our intersection, set intersect dot append item. And uh, at the end of all that, we can just return our uh, set intersect. So let's try this out. Um, let's try this out for uh, anim1, anim2, and anim3. Anim1. And we'll just print the results. So I don't think there is actually anything that intersects between all these. Um, let's double check. So uh, it doesn't look like it. Tiger and cat intersect between anim1 and anim2. Uh, between anim2 and anim3, we've got uh, eagle, shark, uh, and that's it. So why don't we, um, why don't we just add tiger in down here? So we'll have lion, tiger, and so what we should expect down here is is tiger, but that's not what we're getting. Hold on. Ah, let's find out what's going on here. Let me just make sure I don't have a logical error right here. Nope. Okay. Might have to troubleshoot this a little bit. If the item is not in the set. Huh. Does it? Oh, well, that's strange. I wonder what's going on here. Hmm. The item's not in the set, is member, it gets false. Here, let me uh, let me paste this in, and there might be something uh, you know very minor. Um, if you want to give this a quick run, um, there might be something very minor that I'm missing that you got right in yours. So let me just uh, scan through this really quick. Um, make this a bit smaller. So we pass in anim one, anim two, anim three. Uh, if the length of multiple sets greater than one, and uh, all of the all of those are uh, have a length of greater than zero for each item in multiple sets. Why don't we just try this with anim one and anim two and see if that works. Okay, it works for anim one and anim two. So what is happening with anim three? That's the real question. Oh, oh, hmm. I swear, I just put in, <laughs> oh, I see, the, I see the issue. Remember when I copied all of these? Um, they live in two different places and I'm overwriting it. So that makes sense, it's a danger. There we go. Uh, it, was, it was actually an error with the list. So this code itself actually works fine. Um, okay, I'm gonna paste in this intersection code and um, the uh, and uh, the intersection multiple sets code that's in there should be fine. Okay, so let's take a five minute break, and when we get back, we'll uh, we'll cover the next couple of set operations um, in a very similar way as to what we've been doing so far. So I'll see you all back here in five minutes.
All right, so let's pick up uh, with the next set operation that we'll consider. And that is the set difference, okay? So um, this is difference. We've uh, talked about intersection, sorry, uh, union and intersection so far. Um, difference, it's pretty straightforward, very easy. Um, we'll again have this A and B that we're considering, right? Um, so if we're thinking A minus B, A, the difference between A and B, um, we're going to include everything that's in A that is not in B, right? So uh, effectively, we've cut out this intersection and we're cutting out all of B as a result uh, or in the result. So um, notice that, that this is not, we, we cannot flip this around. We cannot say that A minus, A minus B is the same as B minus A. This is not that kind of operation. Um, because, you know, maybe this is obvious, but uh, if we were to say B minus A, right, B minus A, that's going to be everything that's in B, right, that is not in A. So uh, it doesn't work both ways in, in a difference. So let's, um, yeah, let's code out the difference function. So, um, what we can do here is, uh, let's say def uh, difference, let's just call it difference between list one and list two, list one and list two. And then uh, we're gonna use the same data that we used before, you know, same, same thing. Um, and let's see, I think that's all you need. Yeah, that should be it. Okay. Um, again, oh, sorry. Some, uh, just a quick test code, right? We'll, we'll pass in anim1, and uh, this will be anim1 minus anim2, right? And what that should get us is, well, let's find out. So anim1 minus anim2 is going to be uh, everything except for um, uh, tiger and cat. So I believe that's what we would expect. Okay, so I'll put... Um, Put that in Slack, and then I'll put four minutes on the clock. And yeah, oop, <laughs> type that in the wrong place. Sorry. There we go. Okay, go for it.
It's awesome. Uh, seeing a lot of good uh, responses on this one. So, um, so I think you're all getting starting to get the hang of this. Uh, very similar way of thinking, very similar patterns, algorithm, however you want to think about it. Um, just continue that. So I'm going to define uh, an empty list called set difference. Uh, this isn't the only way to do this. Uh, I think it's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, and I'm going to say for each item in list one, because that's the list of interest. Uh, if the item is not in list two, then we can append it to the set difference. Okay, uh, set difference dot append the item, and um, we can just return the set difference. Okay, so if I run this, let's see if let's see if that does what we think it's going to do. Uh, jellyfish, lion, cricket, squid. Awesome. So that looks like it works. I'll paste this in. And uh, you know, keep in mind, we're not going to make a difference of multiple sets here, right? That, that's not going to actually make sense um, for our purposes. Um, we could take a slightly different approach here. We could say for each item in list one, if the item is in list two, then we could say uh, we could remove it from, we could take a reductive approach. But at the end of the day, is that really going to be better or worse? Um, you know, maybe it would be slightly more optimal to say the set difference is going to get list one dot copy, right? And then if the item is in list two, then we could say the set difference dot uh, remove the item. And that that should work in the same way. And that kind of uh, more clearly matches the intuition around what difference is. However, um, is it does it really make a difference? Uh, I think what what's probably going to happen here is that we perform this condition less often. So there's a few less operations uh, because we've already packed set difference in. But um, ultimately, it's not going to make a difference for what we're doing. So um, it's just another way that you could have written it. OK. So now let's talk about an incredibly important concept that's going to come up over and over and over and over again. Um, it's going to become, it's going to be crucial in a lot of the ways that we understand uh, probability and uh, the way we approach distributions and things like that. And that's the complement. So we still have uh, our set, our sample space S. And let's say in this case, we're only going to consider A. So uh, A in relation to S. There are the things that are in A that are uh, not in S. Sorry, that, so everything in A is in S. There are the things in A. Um, and then there are the things in S that are not in A, right? So if we want to consider the complement of A, which I'll call not A here, and I'll show you some other ways that we might refer to this, um, not A. That is going to be everything, literally, that is not in A. It's going to be everything else, right? So uh, how else might we, we represent this? Um, this is the way I like to represent it, A with an overbar uh, as not A. Um, you have this tilde A, that's not A. Um, a prime is also not A. So, uh, you know, it may, there, there's just a lot of different ways to say this, to say not A, um, or A complement. So uh, let's think about coding this. But uh, we want to be careful in how we think about coding this, just to be, and, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, also, uh, you know, this idea, not A, if A was a Boolean, we would be taking the complement, right? So what is the bully, What is the complement of false? Well, that's just, uh, you know, what's not false? Well, not false is true. True is everything else in the set that contains false and true. So um, there's a very clear correlation between, uh, or a very clear uh, relationship here between um, the set complement and the logical complement, as, as there are for, you know, 
intersection and and, or union and or. Like all of these are parallel operations between sets and um, between sets and logical operations. So let's, uh, we need to think about complement a little bit differently, okay? We need to think about complement in terms of the sample space, okay? So we're gonna pass in a sample space and a list. Um, with that in mind, I'm gonna need to define our sample space. So why don't I call the sample space, this can be the union of, what is it, union, I'll wait for it to pop up, union of multiple sets, and we can pass in anim1, anim2, and anim3. And let, let's imagine that there's some other set that, that we can just define, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, put another one in here. So I'm just gonna back this to here. And uh, our last set that we'll consider is gonna be, it's gonna have, uh, I don't know, um, snake, whale, um, maybe, uh, oh gosh, a bat, how about that? And, um, and it has another cat in it. So our sample space includes more than just what's in anim one and two and three, okay? So we've got all of this. And when you run this, uh, let, let's run this against anim one, right? So let's run this uh, against anim one. And what we should expect here is, well, I'll just copy all of this and edit it accordingly. So, um, so lion, uh, if it's the complement of anim1, then we shouldn't have lion in there. Uh, well, we shouldn't have any, uh, we shouldn't have lion, we shouldn't have tiger. I'll just do it like this, lion. Tiger, tiger, uh, we shouldn't have, oh, we shouldn't have cat. Okay, so I think that should do it. And just take me a second to clean this up. And then uh, we should have snake, whale, and bat in there as well. And I do think it should be in this order. We'll find out. Um, I, there's a chance I made a mistake in there, but I, I do believe that's what we're dealing with. Eagle, shark, manta ray, meerkat, dog. Oh, got shark in there twice. And eagle in there twice. OK. I think that's good. All right, so I'll paste this in. And I will put, um, I'll put three minutes on this time because I think, I think this should be pretty straightforward. Um, and there's a, a very quick way that you can solve this. Okay, so go ahead and get started and I will put uh, three minutes on the clock.
One minute remaining. Time's up. Three minutes have elapsed. Okay, so let me show you the easiest way to solve this. Complement is kind of the uh, special case of of difference, and we can just say sample space set one here. Uh, so that that's the quickest, uh, easiest solution, um, dependent on oh. Difference is not defined. Hold on. There we go. That's the quickest, easiest way to think about this and to run it. Set one is not defined. Of course it's not because it's called list one. Let's see if that works. Uh, and what we're getting, eagle, shark, manta ray, meerkat, dog, prairie dog, snake, whale, bat. Okay, so that works. Um, another way we might do this is with a reductive approach and um, so I'll paste this one in, uh, and then I'll just solve it a couple other ways. Uh, it should be fine. Um, hmm. That's a really good question, and I, I'll answer that question in just a moment. So, uh, Another way that we could do this, we could make a copy of the sample space. Okay, so um, I'll just call this output, uh, or I'll call this the uh, set difference. No, I'll call this the, I'll just call it the complement with an underscore. And this will be a copy of the sample space. And uh, we can just say uh, for each item in list one, since that's our uh, smaller uh, set, we can say um, complement dot remove um, each item. And then we can just return that complement. So that's another way to do this uh, through a reductive approach. And we get the same result, right? Um, and think about the complement is everything that's in A that is, um, sorry, the complement is everything that is not in set A or everything that is not in anim. So there might be items shared between anim and other sets, but we don't really care about that. We're just looking for everything that's not in anim one, okay? Everything else is fair game and, and should be included if it's in the complement. Uh, so I, I think that might be addressing your question. If it's in the sample space outside of A and in A, that doesn't make sense. But that's the thing. If it's in A, it's not outside of A. It, it's not simultaneously in and out of A. If it's in the sample space and in A, uh, well, let's think about it like this. Uh, so let's think about these other, you know, maybe here's B and... Here's C, and then here's that one that we tacked on. Well, I don't think that one actually shared anything with A. So when we're looking at this, there are going to be items that are in A and in B, or in A and in C, um, and maybe there's some shared. We're still going to exclude everything that's in A, even if it's in B, right? Um, it's just, it's, it's still all of it's in S, and there's only one instance of each item. Um, 
Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. I uh, uh, hope that clarifies what's going on there. Um, and uh, why it's going to show up still uh, if it's in the, if it's a complement, if it's not, as long as it's not an A, it's, it's going to show up. Um, so this is a reductive approach. We could also take an additive approach where, you know, we simply do uh, for item in the sample space instead. Uh, if the item is not in list one, then we can um, go ahead and append that item to that complement uh, collector. And that will also work. So notice there, there's three different ways to solve this. Um, the easiest way is just that difference that I showed you. You know, you might as well solve it that way since we already have a function that's doing the heavy lifting of this. This is essentially the same function as the difference function. So um, any way that you want to write that is fine. Uh, and maybe I'll leave the reductive approach up here because um, uh, maybe maybe just because we don't always think in terms of reducing. And I think um, there are going to be some, some ways that we start approaching uh, probabilistic concepts through an idea of reduction. So sample space, sample space, copy. Okay, that looks good. All right. Okay. So let's consider let's consider something um, a little different, and uh, th this is a breakout that we have to find. Um, but I'm not going to do this as a breakout. I'm going to walk us through. Um, I'm going to walk us through defining a sample space, uh, since. I don't think we do that at any, any earlier point. And I, I do think it's really important. So um, this is getting us in the direction of counting, uh, which is something we're going to do a lot of um, pretty soon. So uh, we've got these four, you know, these four things that we're going to do. Uh, write out the sample space. Is it four things? I guess it's, uh, let me separate these out. OK, so one write out the sample space, um, and then two, list the sample points, and three, list those sample points. Okay, so let's let's take these one at a time. And um, we'll use this as a bit of a stepping stone for a couple uh, upcoming concepts. Okay, and that. Okay. So first, we have uh, write out the sample space for a random experiment as defined uh, sequentially, or which is defined as sequentially completing the following steps. First, we roll a four sided die, then we flip a coin. And finally, we flip the coin a second time. Okay. So uh, let's, let's think about this. Okay, we've got three different um, processes, phenomena, something like that. And we're kind of putting this together into a single phenomenon, right? Uh, first, we're going to roll a four-sided die. Well, let's think about the options in a four-sided die roll. Well, that's going to be, uh, let's call this four-sided, and this will be one, two, three, and four. Those are the potential outcomes. And then let's think about the options in a coin flip. This is a fair coin flip, and this is just going to be heads and or uh, tails, okay? And then we're going to do the uh, coin flip twice. So how do we build this sample space kind of simply procedurally in Python? Um, it's actually pretty easy. We can say for um, roll in four sided, that's gonna be the first thing we do. We can say for flip one in coin flip. And then uh, since we're going to do that twice, then we can just do flip two. And here's the sample space that we're building. Okay, sample space gets uh, an empty list, and I'm going to pack that empty list in. I'm going to say sample space dot append, and I'm going to append sublists into this. I'm going to append the roll, uh, flip one, and flip two. So now let's take a look at what uh, what this looks like. And I think that's going to um, lead us in the direction of counting. And it's going to lead us back to this idea of 
how do we build a subspace? Uh, how do we build a subset of our sample space? Um, how do we analyze that kind of procedurally in Python? So this is actually counting. This is a form of counting that I'm doing here. So I'm going to say for uh, outcome in sample space, and let's just take a look at how we're counting. Uh, we'll just print each outcome. Okay. So uh, this is, it's kind of a funny numeric system, right? We start at one heads, heads, one heads, tails, one tails, heads, one tails, tails, two heads, heads, two heads, tails, and so on. Um, notice this is every possible outcome. That's what's going on here. This is every possible outcome. This is our sample space. So we can take that. We've got this sample space. We can now uh, begin to analyze it, okay? We can uh, look at this step two where it says list the sample points in the following events. A is the event in which the die roll results in exactly one pip showing. B is the event in which at least one of the coin flips results in heads. Okay, well, let's define A first. Well, A is going to be a subset. I'm going to build a collector here. And I'm going to say uh, for each outcome in our sample space, right? So we can start off just like that. We're going to collect anything that, that fits this description, the event in which the die roll results in exactly one pip showing. Well, um, we can see that it's these first four, right? It's those first four. So how do we get that procedurally? Um, well, if outcome sub zero, this uh, first item in, in this list, in this sub list, if that outcome has a, uh, sorry, if that outcome has a one in that position, right? Then we can say a dot append, we can append the outcome. So why don't we take a look at a? Uh, indeed, 1HH, 1HT, 1TH, 1TT. So that makes sense. That just works as we'd expect it to. All right. So we can also build B. And B is the event in which at least one of the coin flips results in heads. Okay. Well, this is going to be very similar in, in some way. We just need to change our condition, right? So if the outcome, uh, if the outcome dot count in this case is what I'm going to do, if the count of heads is greater than one, right? That's that's what we're looking at. Uh, the, at least one of the coin flips results in heads. At least one. So if uh, if that's the case, we can append it. We can say uh, b dot append the outcome, and now we can print uh, we can print b, and uh, we should see some result. One um, hh, two hh, three hh. Oh, sorry, greater than or equal to one. At least one heads. So we're going to see something a little bit longer than that. There we go. 1HH, uh, one one 1HT, H, one 2HH, one uh, two 2HT, H, two H, two 2TH, right? So you can see that there are these different patterns um, that lead to an event being in B. And uh, with that, we can, we can start doing some things, right? Um, one of the things we can do, and this is just a prelude to, to things, we can ask, what is the probability of event B occurring? Well, the probability of event B occurring is just the length of B divided by the length of our sample space. And this takes us back uh, to that thing that I said earlier where, you know, the probability of, and this time I'll say B, this is going to be the magnitude or the cardinality of B over the cardinality of S. That's all that is. Right, um, and that that's a pretty good model for probability. It's it's something that we can reuse and we can think in those terms very often. So um, here we're just printing the length of B divided by the length of the sample space, and that's going to get us the probability of event B occurring in this process. Three quarters of the time, 0.75. Okay, um, pretty pretty straightforward, uh, I think. And um, you know what we're going to cover that. Uh, in much more complex ways, but in a similar filtering fashion, okay? So uh, list the sample points which are in the union of events A and B from above. Well, that's easy. We can just say union of A comma B, and if we print that, um, we can get a sense of what that is. 
okay, well, you know, we're not able to read that very well, you know, given its format, but we could even ask the question, what is the probability of either uh, event A or event B occurring? Well, we can do that very simply. We can say uh, the union of A, B, A and B, the, the magnitude of that, the cardinality of that, uh, I should say, um, divided by the cardinality of the sample space. So what is the probability that uh, either A or B will occur? Um, looks like it's uh, 0 0.8125, 81, roughly 81%, right? So um, this is, again, this is leading us into the realm of probability from set theory. Um, and those, for our purposes, are going to be inextricably connected. So let's do, hmm. Okay, let's do let's do one more of these, and this will be very similar to the prior one. Um, uh, and uh, this is one of those uh, skills that I'm going to encourage you to really develop. Think about um, these kinds of operations where it's like, oh, I'm flipping a coin, then rolling a die, and then doing this thing, and then doing that thing, and then selecting an animal from this list. You know. Um, Think about those and start building, uh, start using this sort of nested for loop procedure to uh, construct a sample space. Um, it's it's pretty nice. It's pretty easy to do, and I think it really frames probability very well. Um, uh, whereas you know, if you approach purely from a theor theoretical standpoint not having a procedure, uh, probability can be somewhat unintuitive at times. Um, at any rate, let's, uh, let's describe this. Uh, given the random experiment, which is defined by four sequential flips of a fair coin and the following events. Okay, so uh, four sequential flips of a fair coin. Let's think about that. Let's first build our sample space. And um, this is a fair coin, so we've got, uh, you know, uh, flips is going to be uh, it's it's going to be either heads or tails, right? So I'm just going to call this heads. Uh, I'll do tails first, actually, and then uh, heads. Okay, those are the two potential outcomes, and we're doing four of these in sequence. So I can say for uh, flip one in flips, and I'll just do this four times. Okay, so flip one, flip two, flip three, and flip four. And again, I'll, I'll just call something, uh, I'll call this sample space again. So we can just pack in our sample space. Sample space dot append, and we can append a list containing uh, flip one, flip two, flip three, and flip four. And if I do for uh, outcome in uh, sample space, just print the outcome, we can get a sense of all these outcomes, right? And for some of you, this might start looking like counting. That's because that's what we're doing. This is actually counting in binary um, in this case. We could replace those tails with zeros and the H's with ones, and we would be counting to, in binary. It would be the same exact thing. Um, this is systematic. It's exhaustive. It get, gets us every possible outcome in the sample space. So um, let's look at these events. A, there are three or more heads. So let's define A. That should be pretty easy. Um, so A gets an empty list. And then um, you know for outcome, I'll just copy this. Why not? Remember, copy paste is your friend, and uh, we'll say uh, if the outcome dot count. Uh, what, what is it? It's uh, three or more heads, right? So there are three or more heads. So count of uh, h is greater than three. If that's the case, then a dot append the outcome. Okay, so that should construct a. Uh, let's construct b now. And uh, B, there are two or few, 
uh, two or fewer tails. Uh, this said three or more. This should be greater than or equal to. Made that mistake last time. Um, so this one should be less than or equal to two um, for the count of tails. So the outcome, uh, if outcome dot count of tails is less than or equal to two, then b dot append that outcome. And then we have a, another uh, event c. And c, all of the coins show the same face. Well, that's that's interesting, right? That's all heads or all tails. So uh, if we want to do this procedurally, um, for outcome in sample space, let's say uh, if, you know, I don't know. Let, let's do this in just a nested for loop just to be silly. Uh, for, um, well, what would be a better way to do that? Uh, let's do it like this. Let's not be silly and <laughs> let's do it in a better way. If outcome dot uh, count of H is four or outcome dot count of tails is four, then we'll say C dot append the outcome, okay? So uh, now we have, uh, we've defined, uh, sorry, we've built our subsets. So we can perform these other operations. Uh, list the sample points in each A, B, and C. Uh, well, we can do that. We can just say uh, print A, print B, and print C. That's easy enough. Um, I'm not going to run that like that because it's just going to be kind of a wall of stuff, but that's okay. Um, maybe what I'll do instead is maybe try to keep it a little cleaner and uh, print the outcome in, in each of these. So just to be a little nice, oops. We'll do A as well. And then I'll print A, oops, do that. And okay. List the sample points, that's what that's doing. And then let's list the sample points in the set A uh, and not C. Okay, so um, if you see uh, something like this, so we've got A, C. This is the intersection, okay? That is another way to represent the intersection. This just means A intersects C. Um, that's, uh, that's what we're seeing here. But now we're seeing A intersect, not C. Okay, so how do we represent that? Um, we could say, uh, we could say uh, this is the intersection of A and uh, the, well, if we're saying not C, then we need to build some sample space, right? So we've got a, oh, sorry, we have a sample space. Let's do the complement of the sample space with C, okay? So that should get us the intersection of A, not C. And now we can list the sample points in the set uh, not A intersect C, and in this case, we would take the complement of the sample space right, the sample space um, against the intersection of A with C. So there might be some typos in there. Um, we'll find out. I'll just run it, see what we get. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any typos. Um, it is a little hard to read, uh, you know, not gonna lie. That's not the easiest thing to read. Um, this first uh, part, why don't we just print the lengths of these resulting lists? How about that? So the length of intersection A with the complement of C and the length of the complement of the intersection of, uh, the complement of the intersection of A with C. So uh, one of these is significantly more dramatic than the other. When we take the uh, intersection of A with the complement of the sample space of C, well, 
let's consider C really fast. There are, uh, well, there's A. Oh, I see what I did. How about we print, just to make this a little clearer. So if we're getting the complement of C, well, that's everything that's in the sample space aside from these two items. And then um, if, if that's everything, then uh, notice we're not going to include this all heads. So uh, when we're looking at this, that kind of makes sense. Um, you know, if we're not going to include this because not C, right? then um, this A, which is length five, well, we exclude that and it's going to be length four and we can see that that's the result. That's gonna be four, uh, only four elements, right? And then this other one uh, where we're considering uh, the complement of the intersection of A with C, well, what is the intersection of A with C? That's just this, this is all heads. So um, it turns out that there are two to the four possible outcomes um, given the way we constructed our sample space. And if we're going to remove one of those, two to the four is, is 16, right? Two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16. Um, then we're going to remove one of these and then get the complement, or sorry, we're going to intersect and uh, get this. And then if we take the complement of that against the sample space, well, of course that's 16 minus one. That's gonna be uh, 15 possibilities, 15 possible outcomes for this operation complement of A intersects C. Okay, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we went one minute over. Uh, let's call it there, stay on if you have any questions. Um, let me stop recording really fast.